Well, blimey, I said that it was going to be a bit of a busy Christmas season, and Christ almighty, it ended up being. Hello, guys. I'm back, it's just before New Year's here, and I'm finally ready to get through a ton of this stuff that I've had recorded recently, but not managed to edit. I swear I'm up to my ears in cat footage and stuff to do with the Nightmare Fractal, but let's kick it off with this. Uh, a little bit of lore that I was talking about a while ago, I really wanted to have up around Christmas, and hey, what better thing to return. So, let's talk a bit about the crack in the ice. I hope you guys did have a lovely Christmas season, and, well, let's jump straight back into the swing of things. Enjoy, everybody. Well, hello everyone, it is that time again. Today we're going to be talking about a bit more lore stuff. So last week we did two big videos. One was on Bram and whether he was a douchebag and whether he was any good in the patch or not. And the other was to do with where the story might be taking us next. We know that every new episode of The Living World is going to try and give us a new map. And should the devs continue that, or even if they don't, even if the next patch doesn't give us a new map but it's the one after, we're going to be going to a new region of the world. I put forward in that video that we might be going towards the Isles of Janthea. They had a very significant name drop in the most recent story, A Crack in the Ice, and as far as I can tell, there's an awful lot of juicy, awesome stuff that could go from there. Uh, it's a really interesting region of the world. If you didn't hear my discussions on either of those previous things, there are links in the description, and I would really recommend you check those out. But for those who are on the same page as me right now, I wanted to address some of the things that uh, came back at me in response to those videos and then uh, talk about some other things that maybe we missed entirely in the most recent patch and haven't had a chance to talk about. Fractals aside, because fractals... Whew, there's a lot of interesting stuff there. All right, so let's start with the Janthea stuff. And why? Well, number one, we've got a little bit to say, I guess. But also, number two, the second I put up that video in uh, earlier in the week, it really upset me because something hit me like a ton of bricks that I hadn't mentioned there that I feel like I have to say nice and quick. So, uh, basically, in the second half of that video, I was pointing out all the things, all the times that the developers seem to be uh, making references and cross connecting Connections between the Massart, between Abaddon, and between celestial forces and, you know, large movements of the universe and stuff. Elder Dragon, big, explosive, epic stories. They keep bringing these things together. And I ended up by talking about the very explicit thing they did in Living World Season 2, where they had Lord Audrin's Map of the Mists above Abaddon. And even, I'll go you one further, on that map it actually says uh, to keep the secrets safe or to uh, not look into secrets as far as I remember. They even explicitly references that. Um, so I did want to make one other thing, one other point, one other thing that makes Abaddon somehow relevant to the Massart story, and it is quite huge, and that is the Door of Kamali, okay? So, uh, if you remember, I'm trying to paint this picture of maybe the Massart have some kind of history with Abaddon, maybe there's some connection with the Eye of Janthea to whatever Abaddon was doing and why Abaddon wanted to give us magic and so forth. Well, don't ignore the most obvious and basic fact that we knew about the Massart back at the Star Prophecies. Out of all the races on Tyria, out of the Forgotten, out of any remaining Seers, out of all the Messiah, out of the humans, out of any race, okay, the only ones before us in the events of Nightfall that were actively combating and countering Abaddon, the God of Secrets, the only race that was interested in his activities were the Messiah. And so we hear in prophecies that the Massarts were trying to keep the Titans out because they had heard from Glint's prophecy that the Titans would destroy them all. And Glint's prophecy kind of ended up self-fulfilling in that way. But at the same time, could it not also be true that the Massarts built the Door of Kamali to keep Abaddon's minions out for another reason? Why was it that this prophecy was written? Why was it? Why did the Titans, these minions of Abaddon, scare the Massarts so much? What, what tipped them off to? be there at that area of Tyria where Abaddon's realm was closing in? Uh, was it just because of the bloodstone and it was a coincidence? Were the Massart just trying to tap into that bloodstone and they just so happened to see that Abaddon was trying to get into the world there and so they closed it off because the Titans were a nuisance? Or maybe there's some kind of big backstory. So what I'm thinking, on top of everything I mentioned on that previous video, I'm thinking that if they do establish a very real history between these two things, um, they'll probably explain why it was the Massart that were on the Fire Island chain, so far from the Isles of Janthea, and why, beyond perhaps just the prophecies, was it that these people had built the Door of Kamali and 
tried so desperately to keep Abaddon away. Because at the end of the day, they were fighting against Abaddon's constructs coming straight from the Foundry of Failed Creations and, uh, you know, Abaddon's realm down there. So I think that that could be really interesting. A couple of people pointed out in response to the video as well, uh, we did that thing with the eyes. Don't forget that and how eyes were a big theme of the uh, of Abaddon. Uh, well, don't forget also that the Massart summon Jade Constructs, which also has multiple eyes just like Abaddon does and maybe that fits the theme too a little there so uh so yeah um some other things around that topic maybe not so much to do with Abaddon um but we talked a bit about the gift of true sight so I read you a quote from a throwaway small almost meaningless insignificant line from prophecies where a white mantle character says that uh it is said people who come from the Isles of Janthir have the gift of true sight they are able to tell someone for who they really are now, that throwaway line, okay, you guys need context of where we get that line from. It's from one NPC who is surrounded by a lot of other information, and it is never relevant to the story, has never been relevant to the story. Later on, the gift of true sight becomes something else. It becomes a much more practical, magical thing that you get for becoming ascended that allows you to see the Massad. It wasn't necessarily just about detecting liars or seeing who manipulated you. That seemed like more of a white mantle passed down interpretation maybe, but the point is, this, this uh, explicit line here never really has meant much. But see, when I came on and I did that video and I said that to you guys, a Guild Wars 2 primary audience, you know what you guys said back to me? Many of you realized all of a sudden that this fits Lady Casimir, doesn't it? Lady Casimir, since season two of The Living World, seems to have been developing some ability to tell people for who they really are. She talked about how her ability to detect lies seems to be getting stronger somehow. And it's to the extent that it seems the devs have kind of written her out of a lot of recent patches because to have someone who could just tell a liar uh, would kind of ruin a lot of this stuff with Lazarus. Well, so speculation might be then that... Kazmir is uh, her heritage. She comes from people. She is descended from the Isles of Janthir. And she has the gift of true sight. And it does have this very literal meaning of, hey, it's not because she's a mesmer. It's not just because there's more magic around, but she's from these people. And guess what? They can tell a manipulator. Maybe that's why she chose to become a mesmer, because she had this sort of ingrained in her somehow. They could explore these storylines, and I really like that idea. Maybe yes, with Kazmir. Some people said uh, Marjorie might be the one with the gift of true sight, because she's the one off with Lazarus. Uh, or she'll go and get the gift of tree sight or something like that. Uh, I think that kind of works, but you also have to remember this whole descended from thing. Uh, they've already set up a lot to do with Marjorie being a canthan, and so I think that they, that would a bit unnecessarily complicate, you know, Marjorie's backstory when they can quite perfectly and quite comfortably do it with Casimir there. So yeah, I think we may get a patch where it's Kanak, it's Anise. It's uh, Kazmir, and it's us, and we're heading north, and maybe we're trying to get there, either for a Living World update, or more hopefully, as I said before, fingers crossed, an expansion. Um, so a little bit more about Janthea as well that I should have mentioned, probably. Uh, based on what it looks like from the world map, I think it's reasonable to speculate this could be an obsidian area. It could have lots of obsidian cities, all very dark, you know, black rock, uh, a lot of onyx, shall we say, instead, and maybe... Um, this is what it will look like. A lot of people have the interpretation that Massart have golden cities. Um, and I kind of understand where that comes from, but there really haven't been any super explicit references to the Massart having a gold city. Um, and so maybe the idea that the Massart come from a much darker area that almost is a little Fire Island chain -y excites you. But again, I'd like it to be very different to the Fire Island chain. And then the other idea as well is there could be a bloodstone there. And I'll go you one further. So... We know that the Massat uh, seem to have some affinity with bloodstones. We know that they dabbled with it. We know, for example, that Lazarus was regenerated with the power of a bloodstone and that it's ingrained into them somehow. We know that they were great spellcasters. We know that they collaborated with the ancient races. We also know that current storylines have put a big, uh, you know, hotspot over all the remaining bloodstones because any of them could be tampered with. Any of them could release a ton of energy to Elder Dragons and they all should be serious things for us to look at. So, the idea might be this, that the Massat have, or had, 
a bloodstone in their homeland, the Isles of Janthir, and they were very good at using it. They powered themselves up with it. Maybe their great betrayal of the previous races before was stealing that bloodstone and literally taking that power from themselves despite the risk it posed to the other Elder Dragons. I think that there is sufficient enough of a betrayal that the other uh, ancient races would dislike them for it. So I think that already could be something huge. That's where my money's on right now. What was the betrayal of the Massart to the other races? I think they may have stolen one of the Bloodstones, but I'll do you one even better. I think that they started fiddling around with that bloodstone, not just to take power from themselves and extract it, but I think that they went too far with it. And do you know what I think they did? I think they caused an explosion. I think that what we saw the White Mantle tinkering with in Bloodstone Fen, and just there was an explosion in Bloodstone Fen that was only just stopped in the nick of time, I actually think the reason why the Isles of Janthea might look dead and barren and black and charred even though it might not be a volcanic island chain, I think the reason that it looks destroyed is that the Massart stole a bloodstone from the other ancient races, took it there, fiddled around with it, supercharged themselves, but there was an accident, and I think it blew up, and I think it destroyed them all. And I think that that put the, the uh, race on the back step. I think that set them aback, and I think that it was from that point that maybe they started to die out like many of the other ancient races, or perhaps they had to move somewhere else to the point where they're encroaching on Crichton territory. I think that could be a huge part of their history and something I'm really hoping that eventually pans out because that would explain a lot of different things. What it still doesn't explain though is perhaps this connection with Abaddon and why Abaddon wanted the magic. Maybe he had something to do with all of this. How long ago such an explosion might have happened. But I think at its core... That would be a pretty cool story for them to tell. And uh, these were little theories that started running through my mind uh, when I started uh, looking at your responses. And the whole Bloodstone thing was something I just wanted to uh, talk about and list before anyway. Um, so the final little thing about that video as well, before we quickly move on to something else, is, um, is actually the idea of the next map being Lake Doric. There's two reasons why it might not be that I really should have mentioned and do undermine a lot of what I said in that video. In the uh, balance of fairness, I really do feel like I should point these things out. One is kind of a law reason. Corticus, yes, may be going north of Krita, and yes, he may be going to Isles of Janthea, and yes, going from Divinity's Reach might be the best way to do that, which would take us through Lake Doric, but you've got to think about this. We don't care right now about the Isles of Janthea, we care about Corticus and intercepting Corticus, and Corticus's prior location wasn't Divinity's Reach. In fact, if you were a Minister Corticus, you'd probably want to be really far away from Divinity's Reach. No, last we saw him was at Bloodstone Fen, and the most direct route to the Isles of Janthea from Bloodstone Fen doesn't take you anywhere near Lake Doric. So there's a good reason that maybe that won't be the map we get. Uh, and then another thing to think about as well is in the AMA with a crack in the ice, the developers said that all the maps, at least so far and maybe even in development, that we've seen from Living World Season 3 are being made from scratch. And so that kind of undermines the idea of Lake Doric because we know that Lake Doric if they were working on that, that wouldn't have been made from scratch. That would have been picking up some of their old stuff and their old ideas. And so if they say this, then how can Lake Doric be uh, a candidate? So maybe, maybe Lake Doric isn't right. Maybe that map north of Brisbane Wildlands and across the, the Bandit Bridge is the more likely of the two. And uh, we'll be trying to find Cordicus up there. Who knows? I, I really think my theory right now is we will go somewhere like that. We will find Cordicus. We'll intercept him, maybe kill him or something. But in his dying breath, he points out that there's a bloodstone up there or something. And he's hoping to get it here. Or he tells us that the bloodstone up there has, has exploded in the past. And there's loads of ambient magic. And uh, that's, hey, guess what? Maybe even a little bit closer to Jormag who might also be interested, and then everything catalyzes there before, boom, expansion. So there you go, guys. That's uh, that's what I wanted to say about that. Let's talk about Bram. Um, so, again, I did a video on this last week. We talked a bit about this character. We were wondering whether this was good writing. Uh, again, I'll, I'll say what I said in that video, but again, this is, the, this is the most important thing. Everyone has an opinion. Everyone is talking about it. People are interested. And what that means is, on some level, to me, that has to be good writing, right? Like, that there is so much discussion. You guys gave me a bunch of different viewpoints and things I hadn't considered before. Some of it pretty insignificant, I think. Some of it fairly significant, though. Um, and I kind of wanted to address at least one argument that this was really good for Bram. 
Um, and it was something I touched on a little bit in the video, but I want to go a bit further with, right? And it's this idea, okay? The idea that, yes, Bram isn't acting like a Nornshud. Bram isn't acting like his culture dictates. He isn't acting like Wolf. He is being different. And people saying, actually, I am happy that he's being different because it sort of makes him feel like he has a bit more depth to him. And so I see what people are saying there. In fact, if you look at my criticisms and my comments about the Norn ever since 2012, generally speaking, I've been complaining that they're all flanderized and their characters and they're all so plain and they're all so simple and they're all just me, big Norn. And very rarely do they come into their own and do they act like they are their own characters. And so an obvious solution to that would be, okay, all right, let's have Bram act differently to other Norn to show that these are real things, living, thinking things that aren't just defined by, you know, the tree that they come from. And so I think that that is a really good thing to, uh, to talk about. But I think that with the way that they've done this with Bram, it still trips up a little for me. And I think the problem there is that we just haven't had, as prominent as Bram now is, a great center stage, front running hero character that also is a true norm. I mean, they're out there, and uh, we've heard of especially a lot in Eye of the North, and even Air during the personal story was a pretty good Norn. If you look at that story where Air is trying to go out in glory by running into Honor of the Waves, that's actually a pretty good way that they dealt with the whole Norn viewing death in culture thing for the personal story too. It's just that there was so little dungeon stuff in there, it kind of got lost. Um, so I think they have done some, but... Bram, I feel like, is our first chance to really meet and talk with and interact with a real Norn, a real character that is what you would expect in at least those ways. Maybe they have to lay that groundwork with him a little bit first and then start having him act totally off the wall and totally different so we can clearly see it is a character break because right now it just kind of feels like we haven't had enough of that. And maybe that's where it still sticks out for me just, uh, just a little more. I'm curious what you guys uh, have to say to that. But with Bram further as well, talking about where the story might go, um, there are two pretty cool theories. I just mentioned, actually, Honor of the Waves from Personal Story. Uh, a bunch of Kodan there. We know that Kodan are in the vicinity of Bram right now. One thing I think that would be really interesting is if uh, Bram was calmed down, maybe talked out of it, or maybe cheered up after he does some big mess up, maybe, uh, by, Nor by Kodan, sorry, who came from Honor of the Waves. Perhaps Kodan, that interacted with Air when she did this ridiculous suicide mission, because because she just wasn't thinking clearly. These people perhaps are going to be some of the best people in the entire world at the moment to talk Bram out of what he's doing because they saw his mother do the exact same thing and uh, you know they had to warn that that would have been the end of her if it wasn't for some handy heroes that came along. Uh, moving on as well, uh, another very cool thing from the personal story, at the start of one of the uh, personal story steps uh, as a Norn, you actually get to communicate with Garm. You, I believe this is if you're a wolf Norn. You have to actually talk to Garm. Garm will speak to you. Garm is intelligent. Uh, and so the idea that maybe we could utilize this same idea but with Bram. So Bram speaks to the pet and then the, the wolf is like, yeah, bro, you got to stop doing this. I think that's also a very cool story that would serve to tie uh, Living World Season 3 back to some of those horribly botched and misaligned personal story steps that I think most of us just want to forget about at this point. Uh, let's move on a little bit. I want to talk just about a couple of new ideas too. The first one will be on Bram, and then we'll talk a little bit about um, some of the other things that came to me as I played the patch before rounding the video out. So uh, there is a bit of a theory going on with him, and it's a weird one. It's one that I don't subscribe to at all, but I do want to address it. And it's the idea that Bram might be evil or somehow falling to the corruption of Jormag. So, uh, some people have pointed out that in this last cave instance, there's a moment where it sounds like Rox is about to give you details about something that's happened you haven't seen, but then there's an interruption. It's either when the, the spiders come, or it's when Sons of Svana attack you, or it's when the ceiling falls down or something. But Rox says something to the effect of, oh, don't, don't mind him, it's just that dot dot dot, and then she gets interrupted. You never find out what it is. So there's a bit of a theory that somehow something got to Bram, and perhaps now he, he is slowly becoming Ice Brood. Perhaps he's being corrupted. Uh, we have discussed recently Recently, this idea that okay, Morgamoth was the Elder Dragon of Mind, and Morgamoth is now dead, and now the uh, and now that magic, that essence, that mindiness, uh, is free for the taking from the other dragons. And what does this mean? This means that potentially 
uh, we can see Jormag become a, a dragon of mindiness too. And maybe he can start manipulating people. Maybe he can start getting in their heads. Start making them irrational. Depressing them. Doing what the, it's doing to Bram here to get some kind of early attack off. Maybe Jormag is smart and Jormag knows that this is going to be a terrible idea for Bram to do. And with one fell swoop is going to be able to knock out a bunch of Norn heroes. What if Newt Whitebeard agrees to go with Bram and then freaking gets himself killed? That's a big win for Jormag. And maybe it's all some big, greater manipulation at play. And so I do really like that idea. I'm just not sure I've seen enough evidence for it. So like, you, I can like a lot of ideas about where the story might go, but whether it actually will do that, I'm not so sure. Uh, and the theory goes a bit deeper too. You can look at stuff like, okay, the Sons of Svane was ch chasing Bram down when we went um, and not trying to cover their tracks when we first bumbled into him because he'd done something against them. Maybe he really had done something. Maybe it wasn't all just an accident because of the tonic. And, uh, you know, there could be this whole second storyline going on just beneath our noses that we won't find more out about until until Rocks delivers those details to us. But I don't think they've set it up enough. As cool as it sounds, I don't know whether we'll see them go really hard on that mindy angle for the Elder Dragons just yet. And why? Well, because I think they've kind of got that niche field a bit with the Masat right now and with Lazarus, surely, and with Kazmir. So I don't think they'd want to overload too much. But it's a nice thought. And yes, that would be another thing that justifies Bram's sudden character shift. So yeah. Um, uh, some other areas of the patch, I wanted to talk to you guys uh, for a while actually about the Kodan. I think the Kodan have been fantastic in this patch. One of the best things about the patch is listening to them, listening to them talk about the Spirit of Fire, talk about how they, uh, they revere the spirits and how that's different to the Norn. Um, and you actually get two very interesting conversations with Kodan in A Crack in the Ice. I really think you guys should check out. Now the first one is to do with the Norn. So to set the stage here for you guys, on the one hand we have big, almost giant um, characters, humanoid characters that can turn into bears living in the mountains. And then also we have giant polar bears living in the mountains. Both are intelligent, both are upright, some of them are very individualistic, some of them have a lot more culture and they then work together in different ways. But really, the Kodan and the Norn have always been strikingly similar. In fact, some of the earliest Guild Wars 2 concept art out there is of a Norn with a Kodan. I believe it's with air with a Kodan. And people were always wondering whether that was going to be some kind of polar bear transform. Because uh, we all thought Transforms as Norn would be a bigger part of the game and then you did in the end. But hey, let's not dwell on that too much. So it's always been very interesting to wonder, well, what is their connection? And the theories have long been out there that maybe the Norn are just long, deep descendants of the Kodan uh, that arrived much earlier than these contemporary Kodan did. And the game actually supported those theories with this patch. There's a beautiful story you can get. If you interact with some of the Kodan, you ask them about the Norn, they'll say, well, I'll answer your question with a story. And they talk about the Kodan from the super far north, way beyond the Bitter Frost Frontier, way up in the Arctic Icelands of the north, many, many, many years ago. And they talk about a great storm hitting. It seems that they're talking about the previous Elder Dragon and rising and they're talking about how a great many of those Kodan back then decided to just stay in their halls and try and weather the storm and they'd be hungry and they'd be starving but they'd do it and they'd wait for the storms to pass while others uh, grew restless and they grew tired and they they wanted more for themselves and so they picked up their weapons and they went out to hunt and they went south to hunt to places where maybe the storm hadn't reached yet and those Kodan that did that were never seen again and so what are they subtly trying to tell you there, guys, is that the Kodan believe that those old Kodan to have left and searched for southern hunting grounds maybe had devolved somehow, as the Kodan would say, devolved into the Norn we now know. And so what that it means is that's more in-game evidence towards this theory. I've always really liked that story and it was so cool seeing that come back in this patch. It was so cool the way they told the story as well. It wasn't just some like horrendous information dump. It was this really kind of uh, sweet story that you're trying to decipher the meaning of as you hear it. And, uh, and so yeah, that was one of the really, really cool things. The other very cool thing that you could get information from about with from these Kodan, and particularly I want to pick this bit of dialogue here out, because it was some of the most interesting stuff from the whole patch. So you can speak with a previous claw, presumably, or leader as they refer to them now, of this Kodan sanctuary in Bitter Frost Frontier, who's now stepped down. So this is an old Kodan, who uh, seems to have quite a lot of knowledge about a great many different things. And they're talking about the nature of magic, and specifically 
specifically how things operated during the previous Elder Dragon Rising. And they say something immediately which I believe is kind of verified by Massart teachings from the previous patch, and that is that in the last Rising, it was the elite who had magic. Uh, there were a lot of races around, but only very few hoarded it. And these were um, the greedy ones, the people like the Massar, like the Seers, and uh, they had great power, but that necessarily wasn't distributed all over the place very well. And this Kodan, first of all, talks about something quite interesting, which is uh, a kind of suggestion and direction for the franchise, which I really like the idea of. And that is that now, the reason why we're able to kill Elder Dragons now in this cycle, and that the Tyria of today, for Guild Wars 2 of today, the reason why things are different is because magic seems to be everywhere now. And lots of people have power. And they talk very clearly about how the scales and the balance can be tipped by a great many different people and that's exactly really what I've wanted to see I've wanted to see the Elder Dragons die and our story now transition gradually into a place where it's what do the people with more nuanced and interesting motivations perhaps than Elder Dragons, what do the people do with magic and the Kodan basically seems to say that's where they see this story going which is very cool but there's even another nice little touch here and of course it's because we have a Kodan talking about the ancient races. So when we talk about the ancient races, we talk about the Jotan and we talk about the Seers and so forth. We don't actually talk about the Kodan. Now we know the Kodan to be very old. It's kind of like the Char. We know the Char to be very old, but they're never really included among those elite races from the previous Rising. And why is that perhaps? Because this Kodan here specifically seems to know quite a lot about what happened, especially a really cool comment about the Forgotten. So, the Forgotten have been in the story quite a lot recently. Uh, they are kind of the puppet masters behind what's going on with the Exalted. You can't help but think of the Forgotten when you're dealing with Aureen. So, uh, the Forgotten have been big, big parts of this world. Uh, a lot of Season 2 ended up dealing with Forgotten Rituals and things, but we haven't really seen very much of them, have we? And so, every time a Forgotten comment comes out somewhere, it's, it's nice. I think it's something we should hone in on and grab. And the Kodan go one even further. See, they are referring to the ancient races, and they say the Jotun, the Masat, the Seers. And then they stop and they say, plus those beings from the gods' realms. And that's quite fascinating. I really like that tiny little thing there in the patch because what it shows is that the Kodan and the developers as an extension thereof, even the Kodan appreciated that the Forgotten were more stewards of the gods. The Forgotten weren't necessarily native to Tyria. We consider them as one of these ancient races and these elites, but they even appreciate that the Forgotten came from the gods' realms. And that's really curious, guys, because if you think about the timescales and the timelines here, we think about the gods as only having arrived on Tyria after the Elder Dragons fell, but we think about the Forgotten as having been on Tyria before the Elder Dragons fell, like way before. And what this shows in a really subtle way, everyone, is that perhaps the gods had some involvement, or at least there was some connection between the gods' realms and Tyria, long before the gods formally came to Tyria and brought the humans and did everything we know, which was fairly recent here at history within the order of a thousand years rather than tens of thousands of years. So if you followed me through that, I think that's all really interesting. And the fact that it's in this recent patch shows that the developers have considered it and shows that there might be a little bit something more going on and something a bit more special and a bit different about the Forgotten rather than, again, the Jotanse, who are much more native. I wish we could have talked to this Kodan so much more about people like the Jotan. I mean, the, both of these guys are from the mountains, for example, but that wasn't really an option. Uh, but I definitely came away from this guy feeling very satisfied. Seriously, go check it out, guys. It's the NPC near the bank at... Um, the uh, sanctuary in the new map, and I think every little word that they wrote there is well worth thinking about. So, uh, so yeah. So, uh, that's pretty much it for now, guys. Do keep leaving your comments. If we get more cool discussion, I will be uh, delivering more for you. There are at least two more big videos I'm going to be doing about the story. One of them is to do with Ark, and it's to do with a destroyed planet, and it is to do with the fractals of the mists. And the other thing that I'm going to be talking to you guys about is dragon magic and corruption, and what exactly happened in that cave where we killed grubs and hurt something, and maybe where the devs might be messing up with their own lore a little bit. So uh, we'll have spotlights on that going forwards. Uh, thanks very much for watching. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. I wanted to do a little bit more uh, story talk for you. And hey, the next patch can't come soon enough, right? So thanks, guys. Hope you had a wonderful Christmas, and I'll see you next time.
There was a whole de uh, team of developers answering various questions about different areas of the game. Uh, and before people even got to ask anything, Mo already launched in with a couple of big statements on a variety of important topics that have already been sort of floating around. Number one, insider trading. So the story here, if you guys don't remember, is uh, some people who are privileged enough, such as myself, to get access to these patches early in order to deliver content and provide press on it, uh, were looking at recipes and potential ways that they could manipulate the market using this insider information to uh, kind of cheatily get tons of in-game funds and gold and blah 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 and whatnot. And so uh, there was a big old blow up about it. ArenaNet actually ended up suspending